I want to read this to you, Luke chapter 8, verse 4. Here's what it says. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns or the weeds which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and it yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Here's what Jesus says. Here's what I want you to listen to. When he said this, he called out and said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. That tells me something, that just because you hear this story doesn't mean you really understand what God is trying to say. And what God is trying to say to you this morning is this, beyond the story, there's something deeper. There's a revelation that I want to teach you. And so I believe today God is calling us to hear his voice at a deeper level. And so the title of my message is simple. We're in this Hey God, It's Me series talking about connection with God. Here's the question I have for you today. And this question really sums up my entire, entire sermon. Here it is. How's your reception? Put that in the chat right now. Ask somebody next to you. How's your reception? Reception. Come on, let's get into this word. Thank you so much, worship team. Uh, don't y'all love our worship team, E2 Worship? Pretty, pretty incredible. How's your reception? You know, I remember when I graduated college, I was kind of in that adolescent season. That was a season of life where... Uh, where you're kind of growing up, you know, your parents have taken care of the bills and now you're learning how to be responsible. I remember that season because for like a split second, I was really excited to start paying my own bills. Y'all remember this season? It, it lasted for like a minute. Like, but, but there's something weird about adolescence where you're like just ready to grow up. And I remember I was, I, I was living in Texas. I'd just taken my first youth pastor position and I was looking through my bills and I was like, man, I, I gotta be an adult. You know, I gotta start adulting here. And the first thing I need to do, I need to get on my own uh, cell phone service plan. My parents have been play, paying my plan for years. They had Verizon. And uh, although it was great service, it was really expensive. And so I started doing some research. And there was this company in town. Actually, they had a store right down the street from me. They were running a deal that if you switched to them, they would give you a free iPhone. And so I went down to the Sprint store. I went down to the Sprint store. And they, they, they're like, hey. You, you a new customer or you, you switch? I said, look, I'm switching for Verizon. They haven't been treating me well. And I started warming up to these guys. And they're like, okay, we got you. They take care of it. I switch over my account. I'm paying way less. Now, I'm paying the bills now. And they're like, look, I know we got a reputation, but I want you to know we have just as good reception as any of those other big guys. I was like, I, I need you to prove it. And they're like, look pull up one of our phones. So I pull up one of the phone in the store and it's got all the bars. I'm like, okay, all right. I live right down the street. So this must, there must be a tower right here. That's good news for me. So I get the plan. I drive away. I got my new iPhone. I'm really excited about this. I call my mom. I'm like, mom, uh, you're the first call on my new phone. I just want to know I cut the cord. I'm paying my own bills now. I'm a real boy. And I get to my house and I'm checking out my new phone. And as soon as, like, it was crazy. It was like outside was fine. As soon as I get into my house, those bars go from full bars to one bar immediately. I'm, I don't know what happened, but I crossed some demonic threshold where I lost signal. And, and I'm, I'm frustrated because this is where I spend most of my time. And, and I got no reception. I'm going to everywhere in my house. I can't get connection. So, so I call up a buddy of mine who has Sprint. And I was like, hey, dude, uh, what you know about this, this reception about Sprint? He's like, man, don't tell me you switched over. <laughs> I said, dude, it's, it's like saving me like 100 bucks a month on my cell phone bill. He's like, you're going to pay in other ways, I promise you. He said, There's just, you just don't get any reception. I said, I don't understand what's wrong with this phone. I can't get any reception. He said, it's not the phone. It's not a problem with the reception. He says, it's a problem with the signal. 
He said, your phone, you got an iPhone. I mean, that's got a great, that's got a great antenna. It's built in. You know, they, they worked out all the kinks. The problem is the signal. Your device can receive, but the signal isn't strong enough. Therefore, you can't connect. And I think many of us, when we feel disconnected from God, we do the same thing in blaming the signal instead of looking at the reception, right? Because there are seasons of my life where I go over here and, oh, man, I feel close to God. I feel connected to God. He's speaking. I'm getting download speed. Oh, my. And then I go over here and it's like I got nothing. Where, God, where are you? I, I can't hear you. And it's so much easier to blame it on sprint. I mean, the signal of the spirit, right? It's so much easier to look at the brand and say, it's because of you that I'm not getting any reception. But I love this parable because Jesus begins this story talking about a farmer who goes out and sows seed. Now, we just read the entire story. So you heard that the farmer sowed seed all over the place on the road, in the thorns, on the rocks, and in good soil. And when he told this story, he was telling it to people who very well understood agriculture and farming and gardening. And so as he was telling the story, some of them were scratching their heads because they're listening and they're hearing about this farmer who goes out sowing seed everywhere. And they're confused because if you're a farmer... You don't sow seed everywhere. Like recently, you know, we got a lot of time. And so I decided to, to get some points with my wife, who, by the way, my beautiful wife is here on stage with me. I don't have to stay six feet distance. No six feet distance between us. But, but I decided I want to love my wife, you know, because I'm a good husband. Right. I take care of my girl. And so I built her a gardener box in the backyard because she's wanting to do all this gardening. And so I built this box. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not too big, but it's, it's this box elevated off the ground. And I, I'm, you know, digging the dirt up and getting it ready. And she says, we ain't going to use that dirt. I said, what are you talking about? We're not going to use She said, that's, that's nasty dirt. We got to get the good dirt. <laughs> what are you talking about? Good dirt. Dirt is dirt. She said, no, I got to go buy dirt. I said, I just bought this box. You mean we got to go buy dirt for the stuff? There's already dirt in the ground. She said, no, there's a difference. I don't want to touch that dirt. She says, I go, so she buys the dirt, she puts the dirt in the ground, and she takes care of it, and that's where she puts the seed. My wife is not throwing the seed all around the ground in our backyard. She's putting it in that gardener box because that's good soil. A farmer understands if you want a good return on investment, you sow seed strategically. Yet Jesus says this farmer sowed seed everywhere. He scattered seed on the rocky soil, in the thorny soil, on the road soil. And, and I think the crazy thing about this is that this farmer, to all the people that were listening, seemed ignorant and foolish. They're scratching their heads thinking, like, I don't think this guy knows how farming works. But Jesus was trying to communicate something. Here's what he was trying to say. You see, God, the gardener, the sower of the seed, doesn't pick and choose the places that he seems strategic to sow seed. In fact, God sows seed in every type of soil because if there's even a 1% chance that he could see a change in that soil, God would invest everything he has. He will leave the 99 and go to the one. If there's a 1% chance, come on, is there anybody grateful that we serve a God who took a chance on us that even when I was bad soil, he sowed his his seed into me. Come on. Somebody put in the chat. I'm grateful for a generous gardener. I'm grateful that God, when he looked at me all messed up, rocky, thorny, he said, I'm still going to scatter seed because even if there's a slight chance that I could get a harvest from you, I'm going to sow that seed into your life. I want you to know this today. No matter how rough you are, you are not beyond God's reach. You see, we, so, we serve a generous God, a generous, and it's foolish to most people. 
It's ignorant to most people. But I love what 1 Corinthians 1.18 says. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Everybody looked at this gardener and said, you are dummy for sowing seed everywhere. But I'm so grateful that the foolishness to the world was forgiveness to me. That seed was my salvation. And though I wasn't good soil, he still found something in me. See, no matter where you are today, you're not beyond God's ability to rescue and redeem and reconcile who you are. God is not a God of prejudice. He's not a God that plays favorites. In fact, he sows seed everywhere. And so if you feel like you're messed up, screwed up, jacked up today, good news. God has a seed for you. And Jesus tells us later in the passage in Luke 8, verse 11, he says, this is what the seed is. It's the word of God. As we're talking about this story, I want you to pay close attention to what Jesus describes in each of the soils, because each of the soil gets the same thing. I love that. Ooh, I love that. That I didn't get a better word than you got. I didn't get more Holy Spirit than you got. I didn't get more of God than you got. In fact, each one of us got the same word of God. And inside that seed is the supernatural sustenance of God to change everything. It looks like nothing, but when it breaks open, when it opens up, everything it needs to bring forth life and fruit and a harvest is on the inside of that seed. And when you get the word of God in your life, everything changes. One seed can turn into thousands. And we all got the same seed. We all got the same word of God in our life. You see, the signal is ready. The question is, how's your reception? Put that in the chat. How's your reception? The signal is ready. God has released a signal all over the world. Even in your quarantine season, there's a signal. There's a word of God for you. The question is, how's your reception? And Jesus begins to take us on a journey through four different types of soil. The soil represents the type of hearts that the word of God would come into, either to be received, rejected, or released. But the question is, what type of soil are you? How's your reception? How Are you receiving the word of God in your life in this season? I think all of us shuffle through all of these soils at some point or or another. But I want you to evaluate as we tell this story where your heart is today. How's your reception? Because the signal is ready and releasing. Are you ready to receive it. Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, verse 5, he says, as he was scattering seed, some fell along the path, it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. The first type of soil that Jesus discusses or talks about in this story is roadside soil. This is soil that the farmer went and sowed. You know, his farm would get right up to the edge of the pathway. And as he was sowing seed everywhere, he took some and said, you know, I'm going to throw it on the roadside. Interesting and, and almost foolish in nature, but, but the farmer is willing to search for a crop anywhere. He throws it on the roadside. You know, my wife and I will go hiking. We we enjoy hiking. And and whenever we go on hikes, we'll uh, we'll come up to the trail. And and when we're taking the trail up, whether we're going on a mountain or to a waterfall, I'll always think the same thing. I I think to myself, did this naturally occur or did somebody pave this path? You know, did somebody put this? Now, obviously, we know that at some point in time, somebody made this pathway to get to the waterfall because it's just too perfect to get there. But but I always wonder in my mind, I mean, somebody had to lay the trail, but it's kept on going for years and years. And it's so bizarre because the ground on the trail is so clear compared to right next to it, That's growing trees and shrubs and thorns and thistles. Yet for some reason, this dirt is different than the other. And and it's because even though this dirt is made out of the same material as the dirt next to it, this dirt has been repurposed. It's been repurposed. You see, it was taken from the same plot of dirt right next to it that's 
yielding crops, but this dirt had a change in purpose. And that change in purpose happened when somebody pounded and pounded and pounded year after year after year. You see, this dirt got so tough that it became a trail. But it only happened because somebody had a tool that would push on and pound that dirt down harder and harder and harder to the point where it was almost like concrete. This is the stuff that people would walk on. This is the dirt that people would use to get to where they wanted to go. See, anything that experiences that much traffic eventually becomes tougher and tougher over time. This type of soil is calloused. And what Jesus is trying to say about the roadside soil is that roadside soil represents a hardened heart. This, this is the heart that's been trampled on year after year. And time after time, it becomes tough and callous so that when you throw a seed on it, it simply bounces off. It doesn't fall into the ground. The, the ground, the dirt is so hard. It's so callous. It's so tough that it just won't receive. It hears it just doesn't receive. Have you ever met a person like this whose heart is so hard that they hear you, but they don't receive you? This is the type of person whose heart has become so hardened over years of pounding and packing and punching that now they just can't receive. This type of heart is the heart at the end of a marriage. We've been trying year after year, but hurt after hurt, I've closed up. And now you can say it, I can hear you, but I'm not receiving you anymore. This is the person that's ready to break up a month before the breakup happens. They've been sitting on it for a month. Finally, they get to that conversation and they're emotionless. And you're wondering, how could you not feel something? But it's because they've gotten to a point of such toughness that they refuse to receive Maybe they've already quit their job in their mind. They, they've already exited the scene. No matter what you say, they are already ready for your response, and their response is to refuse whatever you say. It's a hard heart. Jesus says the first type of soil is found on the path. It's a hard heart. And the reason why this roadside soil is so hard is because it's been worn in and weathered. You see, a heart only becomes hard because it's been trampled on. We weren't born this way. Like I was at Pastor Q's house this past week. I was holding my nephew, baby Judah, this little baby, innocent and pure, just near perfect. I mean, like 99.9% .9 perfect. He, he wasn't born with bitterness or anger. He wasn't born looking at other people and refusing to receive them. We're not born this way. We're born with open arms. It's over time that we get tough because when we're hurt, when we're rejected, when we're let down, when we're disappointed, our heart gets so calloused and we become difficult to receive any type of development in our life. I think it's interesting that this dirt is made out of the same stuff that grows a meadow, but its purpose has been changed because it's been pounded time after time. And I think that the greater the access, the harder the substance. The paths that have more access are trampled on more and more. And because there's more access, there's more exposure. And the more exposure, the harder the heart. My question for you this morning is, who has had access to your heart? How much exposure have you given to people in the past who haven't stewarded your soul? How many people can just walk into your life, come on, and you could just sleep with out of nowhere because, because you've got access to everybody, but you got no boundaries. You've not held anything close. And now, time after time, you're feeling less and less, and you're wondering why you're so callous, but, 
but it's because you have so much access. And the more access we give, that doesn't mean that we lock ourselves up from everybody, but it does mean that the more access and exposure we give our hearts, the more opportunities for people to trample on it. I wonder, I wonder who has access to your heart. You see, a heart that's been so exposed, eventually it loses its innocence. This happens in marriages. It happens in friendships. Hurt after hurt. It happens in relationships, being taken advantage of. Hey, it happens sexually, sometimes without your consent. Maybe something was taken from you. Your innocence was stolen from you. And now, because you were exposed, you become hardened and calloused. Jesus says that the soil, the soil not only rejects the word of God, but because it rejects the word of God, as soon as you throw the seed onto it, it just bounces off the ground. Have you ever tried to send an email to an address that doesn't exist anymore? It says this email has bounced. Why? Because when you release something and there's a rejection of it, it causes it to bounce back. And when the word of God gets sown into your life and you've got a hard heart, it bounces off. And here's what happens. Roadside soil lacks protection from predators. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 5. It says, not only did the word not fall into the ground, but the birds ate it up. Jesus goes on in verse 12 to explain this. He says, those along the path are the ones who hear, but the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. You see, roadside soil lacks protection from predators. And a hard heart, it looks tough on the outside. But here's the problem. It keeps getting taken advantage of. It's got a tough exterior. But the moment God sows something into it to soften it up, because it's so hard on the outside, it can't receive on the inside. And something comes to steal it away, and it takes advantage of the tough exterior. A tough exterior often leads to a toxic interior because the very thing we need to soften up it's stolen from us. And I want you to know this, that God is speaking a word over your life, even if your heart is hard right now. If you feel like you can't receive, the word of God is being released over your life. But I want you to know something. The enemy hates your guts, and he is out to steal the very thing that God has sown into your life. But I came to encourage you today. All you have to do is allow God to do some work in your heart. You see... If you've got tough soil, you're going to need a certain type of tool to break it up. Sometimes it comes with a sharp edge. I'm reminded of the word of God that the Bible says is sharper than a double-edged sword. Sometimes it takes a tool to dig into the difficulties of our lives and begin overturning the stuff that is so tough on the outside to get the stuff that is tender on the inside. You're not too far from the Word of God to be released into your life. But you're going to need the tools that God has provided to soften up. Jesus goes on to the second type of soil. Here's what he says. In Luke chapter 8, verse 6, he says, some fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. The second type of soil Jesus talks about is rocky soil. He says, the first is the roadside soil. But the second type of soil, I want you to understand, is rocky soil. You know, we've, we've gone over to our mother, my mother-in-law's house. She's got a big old garden in the backyard. She's got all these plants everywhere. There is no place in her backyard that does not have some type of plant, tree, crop, something. And, and it's always interesting to go over there because not only do we get to see all of these plants that she has, but she always sends us with something. We, we never leave her house empty-handed. She always gives us some sort of pot. And I'm like, please, I love you, Mom. Don't give my wife any more potted plants. We have too many. We got, you know, this gardener box, but we don't have a lot of room in our backyard. Our backyard is not on the level of my mother-in-law's. And so my wife, she gets these plants in these pots. And uh, there are days of inspiration that she decides to go plant these things. But some of the days, these pots are sitting around in my house, in my house, dirt in my house. We got potted plants everywhere. 
And it's so crazy because I know that we have great dreams to see our garden grow one day, but it looks nothing like my mother-in-law's backyard right now. It looks nothing like it. I mean, the plants, not only are, do we lack the amount of plants, but the size of these plants. I mean, my mother, she got artichoke plants that are the size of, I mean, my side. I'm not that very tall, but it's still a big plant. But the reason why our plants will never grow to that size is because they've been staying in pots. And for a plant to get to new heights, a plant needs to grow deep roots. And when Jesus is talking about the rocky soil, he's not talking about rocks on top of soil. He was talking about soil that looks like soil. It looks like the good dirt. Get this shot right here. It looks like good dirt from the top at the surface. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you will find a foundation of stone. In other words, this rocky soil represents a shallow heart. It looks good at face value. It looks good on the surface. And at the surface level, it receives the word of God. This is what Jesus says. It hears and receives. But here's the problem. When you dig deeper, you hit rock. And when you hit rock, the roots can't grow any deeper. And if you want to have a tall plant, you got to have deep roots. They say the same thing about skyscrapers. The higher you want to go, the deeper you've got to dig. The problem is, is that rocky soil hears and receives and it grows when it's convenient, but it dies with harsh conditions. It starts strong, but it can't sustain that growth because it has no root system. You see, rocky soil hasn't dealt with the deeper difficulty. In other words, it has quick growth. It, it, it grows up. It, it sprouts out of the ground. But because it can't grow deep, that quick growth leads to a quick death. Shallow soil, a shallow heart, lacks a strategy for sustainability. On the surface, it receives, but there are deeper hindrances. The question is, are you willing to go deeper in your faith or are you staying at the surface? You see, I think many of us, we get all excited. You know, we give our lives to Christ. Yeah, Jesus, I say yes to you. I raise my hand on Sunday. I declare him as my Lord and Savior. And we start to grow. But when we stay at the surface and we don't go any deeper, here's what happens. We build no foundation. And when conditions are convenient, it's okay. We grow, but when the storm comes or when the sun gets too harsh or when we need moisture, those roots aren't deep enough to be able to draw strength from what the foundation needs to be built upon. And so what happens is we grow quickly, but we die quickly. There are deeper things underneath that you haven't seen yet. You see, sometimes you need the type of tool that will break through the surface and go a little bit deeper because down deep, what I find are rocks, stone. The question is, what's the rock underneath the surface in your life right now? Is it a rage problem that masquerades as a little bit of anger here and there, but when you get deep into your marital fights, come on somebody, that rage starts to come out. Maybe it's doubt and unbelief, and you're trusting God, you believe, come on, you're giving your life to Jesus, but you still don't really know if this is for real. And what happens is when we don't go deep, we grow shallow. And as soon as the sun starts scorching, as soon as the wind starts blowing, if we haven't dug deep into the rock, into the stuff that's down there, what we're going to realize is that our roots can't go to build a firm foundation. And now what's at the bottom of the barrel is brokenness. And it's keeping me from going any higher in Christ. Do you have shallow roots? Because here's what I want you to understand is that surface level Christianity will be the thing to die in COVID-19. 
If all I ha- if all I know about Jesus is the stuff at the surface, if all I do is raise my hands and say, yes, God, but I never go any deeper in my faith, when a pandemic hits, it's going to be problematic for my soul because I'm not rooted in the deep water of the word, in the moisture of God's presence. Sometimes I need tools that are going to cut to the heart of the issue. That's going to go deeper into the stuff that's on the foundational level of my faith. Shallow soil. Jesus says in Luke 8, 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. See, rocky soil has excitement, but no endurance. It doesn't last when faith is tested. And if you want to be a healthy plant, you need healthy roots. And if you want to have healthy roots, you need to dig a little bit deeper so that you can break up the stuff that's underneath that's causing you to fall short of growing stronger. Jesus goes on into the third type of soil in Luke chapter 8, verse 7. He said, other seed fell among the thorns or weeds, which grew up with it and choked the plants. You know, when I was young, we spent every Saturday morning weeding the gardens, doing yard work. And I remember we had this big old deck in the backyard, and on either side of the deck, we had these garden beds. The left one was my brother. The right one was mine. And so I would get out there Saturday morning, and we would clean it up. We would weed the gardens. I remember when we first were assigned these garden beds, my dad said, you got to overturn the soil. So we'd get these rakes. We'd get these, these tools out. We'd overturn the soil, pick out all the weeds by hand, and then we'd plant the flowers. I remember I spent an entire week on my garden bed getting all these weeds out of there. And, and, and I got all the weeds out. I planted the flowers. It was beautiful. I remember we stood back. It was just like a masterpiece. We jumped in the pool. We spent the next week just enjoying it. That next Saturday, I went outside, and there are weeds in my garden bed. And my dad said, he said, hey, Jared, come on. It's time to go weeding. I said, what are you talking about? I spent the entire week weeding. I got every single one out. He started telling me, he said, Jared, you spent a week getting those weeds out of the soil. But those weeds have been in the ground for years, reproducing. Before you ever even lived in this house, those weeds were there. And the reason why they're turning up now is because you already overturned the soil. He was saying this to me. You don't see the weeds until you put some work in. I started doing some research on weeds this week because I'm confused about this soil. And, and, and as I was researching about weeds, here's what I found out about weeds. Weeds are they're, 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 they're opportunistic plants, meaning that they can stay dormant in soil for years. But the way that they get germinated and the way they grow is when you start working the soil. And the moment you work the soil, you start turning over the seeds of the weeds. You get them closer to the sun so that they can receive the light they need and the warmth to grow. And so when you start seeing growth in your life, you actually unlock the power of the weeds. This is what I call resistant soil. Resistant soil. This soil has stuff that's been in it for centuries. And what Jesus is trying to communicate about the resistant soil is this. The resistant soil represents a preoccupied heart. It's a heart that had stuff inside of it for years. You just didn't see it until you started putting some work in. Jesus says, the seed fell among the thorns, the weeds which grew up with the plants, but ended up choking out the plants. You see, resistant soil doesn't look resistant until you start reorganizing it. It's a long-term battleground. And here's what I've learned about life with God, is that sometimes I can be putting all this work in to grow, but there's still weed in the soil. And because there's still weeds in the soil, when I start working the soil, it actually starts to cause other things to spring up in my life. I start growing in faith, and then all of a sudden, ego pops up. 
I start growing in blessing and greed pops up. I start growing in discipline and stress pops up. Right alongside the plants, right alongside the fruit, right alongside the good stuff are these weeds. And every time I work the soil, these weeds come back. I could put all this work in one week, come back again, and there's still weeds in the plant. And I started to get some tools out. I'm going to take care of these weeds, man. I'm going to take care of these weeds. I'm getting them out. My dad would say, put the shovel down. He said, these types of things, you got to do it by hand. See, because if you, if you just cut the head off, it's going to grow back. But sometimes the things in our lives that are so close to the stuff that's growing can only be dealt with by hand. And you got to get in there so that you can get the root. And sometimes, come on, come down with me. Sometimes when you get down into the dirt, you're getting your hands dirty. You're feeling the thorns. But sometimes it's the only way to get the stuff out that looks just like a plant but it's problematic. That's what I learned about weeds, because some of them, they kind of look good. We had this one weed in our backyard. We were kind of proud of it. I mean, it was big. It was beautiful, because it was the only thing growing at the time. My wife put it out on Instagram. Should we keep this thing? And people were like, yeah, it looks pretty. Weeds look like plants, which tell me that weeds can look like friends. Weeds can look like blessings. Weeds can look like opportunities. You see, oftentimes, it's the weeds that are growing in the midst of the stuff that we've been working that if you don't look closely enough, you can't tell the difference between what's developing and what's dysfunctional. The problem is, is that sometimes a weed looks like a friend that says it's going to bring you to your future. But if you don't submit that weed to God, it's going to choke out the very destiny that God has for your life. Sometimes weeds look like blessings. And this is why Jesus says this in Luke 8, 14. He said, the seed that fell among the weeds stand for those who hear. But as they go on their way, hey, they grow. But they are choked out. Why? By life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. You go ahead and tell me that as a Christian, you don't have worries. You don't struggle with greed. You don't struggle with the pleasures of life. We all wrestle with that, which tells me this, that every believer is going to have weeds in their life. The question is not whether or not you have weeds. The question is, do you let the weeds win? Or do you let the hand of God reach into your life and by hand, personally, with care, rip out the root system of the stuff that is going to cause you to die? I believe for many of us, the tool that we need right now is God's hand. Because if you take a rake or a pick, to the weeds, it's useless. We need the hand of God. Because when we don't deal with dysfunction, dysfunction eventually destroys us. Jesus finishes out this parable in Luke chapter 8, verse 8. He says, still other seed fell on good soil, came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than it was sown. We got the roadside soil. We got the rocky soil. We got resistant soil. We got ready soil. It's the good soil. It's that good stuff. We brought this in. My wife, she said, that's the good stuff. You can tell by the color. And I'm not talking about the color of people's skin. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the, the stuff this is made up with. There's something that's recognizable about good soil. You can smell it. You can feel it. It sticks on your hands. It's got moisture in it. There's something about good soil. The ready soil is a good heart. And here's what Jesus says about it in Luke 8, 15. He says, the seed on good soil stands for those who with a noble heart and a good heart hear the word, retain it, 
and by perseverance produce a crop. I want to give you the three simple ways to have a heart made up of good soil today. Because here's the truth. I think in every season of life, we fall into one of these four categories. And you can switch. The beauty of God is that God can make good soil out of your grief, out of your disobedience, out of your rebellion. God, the gardener, is a master at overturning bad soil. But we've got to allow God to work in our lives if we want to bear fruit. The first thing, if we want to bear fruit, if we want to be good soil for the word of God in our lives, Jesus says this, you got to have a noble heart. A noble heart, the word in the Greek, kalos, stands for honest or pure. What I love about this word is Jesus is saying that the type of soil I'm looking for is somebody who's honest about where they are and pure enough to allow me to overturn what the soil of their heart looks like. That's, that's the first thing. If you want to have good soil, you got to allow God to overturn the soil of your heart. Here's the thing about overturning. It means changing. It means getting in there and doing some hard work to change the dynamic so that we could be something that develops. Sometimes it looks like a rake. Sometimes it looks like a pick. Sometimes it looks like the hand of God. Every type of soil requires a different tool, but the substance is the same. Look at Romans 2, verse 4. It says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing, look at this, that God's kindness leads us to repentance? Here's the beauty of God. Even when he has a sharp tool that hits into the stuff that's on the deep parts of my heart, it's the kindness of God that begins to melt away the bedrock of brokenness. The kindness of God begins to chip away at all the stuff. But I got to let him overturn some ugly things in my life so that I can become good soil. Can I tell you what this looks like? I had a moment like this yesterday. Worship team, we can, we can get back. I had a moment like this yesterday. I walked into this church building as I was praying and preparing for you. And I turned some worship music on, and I cleaned the room so I could just organize my head. I put some music on, and I just began to do what I always do in prayer. I just began pacing back and forth in this room. And all of a sudden, as I was worshiping, I was singing this song, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. When you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us. It changes what we see and what we seek. I'm singing these words, and all of a sudden, about 20 minutes into it, I start weeping. Uncontrollably, I'm just weeping. I'm walking back and forth. I can't, I can't. Stop weeping. I'm just crying, and I'm walking back and forth. And it's this weird type of emotion. Maybe you've experienced it before where you're crying and you're weeping, but it feels good because you know God's doing something. And as I'm walking back and forth and I'm weeping, God spoke to me. He says, I'm overturning the soil right now. I'm plowing the ground, and as you're walking back and forth, it's like me taking the rake, and I'm overturning the stuff in your life, that hardness of heart, that bedrock underneath. And as I wept, I felt the Spirit of God just turning over all of the stuff, the anger, the anxiety, the stress I'd been feeling, the worry I had for this mess. God's just overturning. That's why getting into his presence is so important. When we worship, when we get in the presence of God, when we get before his face, we yield to the gardener to overturn the stuff in our lives so he can make us good soil. That's why I want you to worship today. 
That's why I want you to spend some time in the presence of God today. That's why you got to learn how to pray until you break through because it didn't happen five minutes in, 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, 20 minutes. Finally, I started to feel the presence of God. You got to learn how to yield and let him work. He's working in your life, but there's a point where something breaks, something changes. He changes the very foundation of who you are and what's on the inside. We got to let God overturn the soil of our hearts. The second thing Jesus says is, it's not just a noble heart, but it's a good heart. That word in the Greek is agathos. It means useful, beneficial, meaning it yields something. And the only way for soil to be useful is if it is consistently tended to. That's the second thing I want you to understand about becoming good soil. You got to let God tend to your heart on a consistent basis because eventually this soil is going to look like this dirt if it has no moisture and if nobody's working it. And here's what the Bible says. Look at this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. But look at this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God does the work. We just make the room. God is the one who works the ground. He's the one with the shovel. He's the one turning over the soil. He's the one with the water of his word. He's the one providing the sunlight and the warmth. He's the one giving the tension. But, but, but we, we've got to make the room. I got to give him access. I got to give him freedom to speak into my life. And you know how he does that? By yielding to him through the ways that he speaks. That means getting in front of his word. That means joining an e-group and getting in a community of people who can point out the areas. Hey, I think you got some bedrock there. I think you got some weeds. I know it looks like a plant, but that doesn't look like what God wants for you. That means getting involved in church and coming to church regularly. That means trusting God with my sexuality, with my relationships. That means giving him everything. He does the work. I just give him the room. We've got to let God tend to the soil of our hearts. And number three, he says, then those who hear the word, retain it, and by perseverance, produce a crop. You see, number three, the way that we become good soil, it's not immediate. It requires time. You see, the funny thing about all of these soils is that they were all revealed through time. Over time, the seed was stolen. Over time, the seed was scorched. Over time, the seed was choked out. But over time, the seed grew. I think so many of us, we want to grow overnight. We want to be it right now. We want to do everything God has for us immediately. But here's the truth about growing in God. It takes time. And there's something about perseverance. In fact, the Bible is clear in Romans chapter 4, verse 13. It says, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. You've heard it said it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, but I would submit to you today, it's not a plant, it's a garden. And God is not simply trying to plant one item, or one seed to get one little crop. He's looking for a hundredfold. And I believe that one day God is going to go through the garden of your life and begin to pick the fruit of joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, goodness, but it's going to take some time. And I want to encourage those of you who feel like you're not there yet. You're not there yet, and it's okay. But over time, endure. Let the seed of the Word of God go deep into the soil of your heart so that you could bear much fruit 